squeeze in shoulder to shoulder. Feel free to cuddle with your neighbor, just please make sure you have permission first. I don't want to bring anybody back with any black eyes. You be sure to keep your seat. When you get up by the elm and get stopped, feel free to stand up, take photos, look at the elm. You'll always be prepared any moment the horses can give the display an old tuck. I would uh, right, guys, yeah, hate just to move the slipper. Every now and again, they can take a step forward and move the sleigh, and we end up having a spill, and that's the last thing we want. We don't want anybody falling and getting hurt. Please also keep track of anything you have hanging out over the edge of the sleigh. We have been instructed as partners with the National Elk Refuge to leave anything that falls out of the sleigh. So that goes for cameras, cell phones, sunglasses, hats, spouses, children, anything of the like. We are not allowed to get out of the sleigh and pick it back up. But as he mentioned, welcome out to the National Elk Refuge. My name is Justin. Our horsepower today is provided by Jack and Joe. These guys are Percheron breed horses. They weigh up, uh, they weigh about 2,000 pounds a piece. In fact, they weigh a little bit more than 2,000 pounds a piece. They can pull four to five times their own body weight as well. If you guys do have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to ask. Do not be afraid to ask any questions that you may have. There are no stupid questions out here out on the National Health Refuge Walk, boys. How many hunters do I have on my sleigh today? I got two hunters out here. You guys elk hunters? Three. Three? <laughs> all right. You guys are all elk hunters then? We yep. shoot anything at night. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, for that then, any questions directly uh, related to the elk will be transmitted back to these gentlemen up here that are the experts up here. Swing across, come on. Justin. Yes, sir. Are you all set up to, on, on extreme cold days like 40 below to uh, feed the horses? We actually do not feed the elk with the horses. I know you don't now, but I, I thought you kept the redundancy. Um, not to my knowledge. Okay. Just because of the fact that we do not, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they do not feed uh, loose hay. They feed uh, with mouth alpha pellet. And the way that they feed that is they have a large caterpillar tractor that pulls a large trailer that is uh, mechanized their feet um, like that. So if there is a redundancy plan for the uh, using the horses, I do not know. But uh, to my knowledge, especially on days that are really cold like that, they keep all their equipment inside and the uh, 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 garage is what I was in for. They keep them in the garage, that way they don't have to worry about the vehicle up the and just uh, the garage. So where's everybody coming from today? You folks in the back, where are y'all from? Nevada. You folks, where are you from again? Everett. All right. Next group. Chicago. Woo, you guys are on spring break out here, ain't you? Warm compared to Chicago. What about you folks? Everett. Holy cow, no wonder you're bundled up. What about the rest of you folks? Germany. Norway. Wow. Kelly, Wyoming. All right, you're just right up the road then, ain't you? Yeah. Wow, boy. Where are you folks? Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia. Utah, what part of Utah? Pleasant Grove. Pleasant Grove, all right. We've been in Logan as well. They've That's got That's actually a... where I'm from. I'm from the Logan, Utah area. I'm from uh, Hyde Park is where I was living before okay. I came out here, so. Uh -huh. So then you guys are familiar with Hardware Ranch then, right? Yep. Yeah. I haven't been there yet, <laughs> so we're going to this one the first times, time. But you guys picked the right place coming here. It yeah. blows Hardware Ranch out of the water. Yeah. Lucky, let's back out. We'll come from the Look at him. This way. So who can tell me the Native American name for elk? Does anybody know? The Native American name for elk is Wapiti, and directly translated, it means elk. I'm kidding you guys, it directly translated, it means white rump. So you look at these bulls that are facing away from us, they do have a lighter colored posterior than the rest of their body. That is their defense mechanism against predators. It allows them, um, if these bulls were to take off running, these other bulls out here in this group, we're going to look over, see those guys running away, they're going to see those white rumps, 
are going to be able to determine that maybe it is time for them to run away. They're not going to necessarily hang around and wait for anything scary to spook them. Yeah, you got to come to where I am. So how many of you folks have seen the antler arches in Jackson? Have you guys seen the antler arches out here? I think I saw it, yeah, when All I was driving right. by. They're right there in Town Square. They got four of them. Who can tell me how many animals have died to make those antler arches? None. As they grow the antlers back, they're covered in what's known as velvet. Velvet is a, um, an intricate vascular system that delivers all the nutrients to the antler as it grows. It'll take about 120 to 140 days for the antler to grow out to its full size, its full potential. And in those 120 to 140 days, if a bull is very healthy and he's on good nutrition, the antlers can grow up to and sometimes even over an inch a day making the antler the fastest growing vascular tissue in the animal kingdom. So when these antlers drop, they do not drop simultaneously as well. You can see some of these big bulls, they do have heavier antlers than others. They weigh about uh, 10 to 12 pounds an antler sometimes. You can imagine if you've been walking around with 24 pounds on the top of your head and suddenly 12 pounds falls off one morning, you're going to be walking in circles for a little bit. So a lot of times when these guys do start to shed their antlers, you see these bulls, you'll see them shaking their heads a lot. They're trying to wiggle or pop that other antler loose. <clears throat> when the antlers fall off, a lot of people like to do what's known as shed hunting. They like to go out and pick the antlers up. Jack, go. Step up. Well, to pick the antlers up out here on the National Elk Refuge, that is considered poaching and it is illegal. The only people allowed to pick antlers up out here on the refuge so are the refuge say. personnel and the Jackson District Boy Scouts. I, as a sleigh driver, I am out here every day. I'm around the job every day. It's got I'm not a huge even allowed antlers. to pick the antlers up. That's because of the fact that I am a partner with the refuge. The I am not an employee of the refuge. Huge rack. We do have some very large bulls out here. <laughs> so with these guys, you can see he's just kind of shambling around. He's not too worried. But if we were to get out of the sleigh right now, he would see the human profile, the human silhouette. They know that as a predator and they're going to take off running. The reason we're able to bring you guys out here in these sleighs is because of the fact when they see the sleigh, they do not see the sleigh as two horses pulling a sleigh full of predators. They see it as one large organism that does not pose them a threat and likes to take pictures of them every day. <laughs> the National Elk Refuge was founded in 1912. When it was founded, it was roughly about 1,200 acres. It was not very large. It has now grown to the size of 24,700 acres. For you folks that don't really deal too much with acreage, if you look behind us over here, you'll see the town of Jackson. The refuge goes right up to the town of Jackson. In fact, it is right across the street from the town of Jackson. And if you look back here behind me, you can see that there is a row of cottonwood trees out there in the distance. That row of cottonwood trees marks roughly the halfway point of the National Elk Refuge. The National Elk Refuge is about 10 miles long and about six miles wide at its widest point. Out here on the refuge, they do have about, um, there's about 5,700 head of elk on the refuge right now. They are expecting about 7,000 head of elk to show up on the refuge. They're also expecting a lot of um, uh, eagles, gold eagles will come out here, uh, bald eagles will come out here, hawks will come out here, they um, will eat the, uh, the dead elk. There's also a lot of coyotes that live out here on the refuge. There's also a pack of wolves that is denned on the refuge out here. With the pack of wolves, they're denned on the north end of the refuge. They're called the Pinnacle Peak Pack. There's about 10 to 12 wolves in that pack. An average pack of wolves will take about one to two elk per wolf per month. So with the pack of wolves the size of the Pinnacle Peak Pack, they're taking approximately around 20 to 24 elk a month. The wolves aren't here on the refuge as of yet. Um, they're more up on, in the east over in the uh, National Forest over there. That's just because of uh, color data. We know that they are still over there in the National Forest. They're not down here on the refuge yet. And even when they do come down here on the refuge, they're not too much of a threat for these guys, especially out here on the flats. That's just because of the fact that uh, if you guys look out here over in the distance, you can kind of see some speckles and spots out there kind of on the white and the snow out there. Those are elk. We can see them. They can see us. 
So if we were to be a pack of wolves sitting right here and we wanted to go get those elk over there, by the time we got over there, the elk are going to have dissipated and left. So the wolves hang out more up in the tree line when they do come down closer to the refuge. They hang out in the tree line and they kind of just wait till the elk kind of get close enough for them to burst out, chase them down and try and get one. The elk can sustain speeds about 35 miles an hour, but can reach bursts of speeds about 45 miles an hour. So it is very um, relatively difficult to run these guys down. How fast are the wolves? I do not know their, uh, their fast um, and sustaining speeds, but that is part of the reason why they um, hang out more up in the tree line, just because um, I know, even though I can't run that fast, um, if you're chasing someone that can run slightly faster than you, you want to get as close as you can. That way you're not having to sustain fast speeds, and all you have to do is burst to get to them. Also, it's a lot easier when you have uh, 10 people, so to say, chasing one person and you're chasing that one person through deep snow. It's a lot easier to wear them down. That's part of the reason why they're still up in the higher altitudes. It's a lot easier hunting. They're still able to get to the feed. But as more of the animals come down to the refuge, the wolves are going to follow those animals. Are you guys using pellets right now or are they just eating? Uh, they're feeding right now. The supplemental uh, feeding program has not started. Uh, the biggest determining factor for when it starts is snow level. So as you look out here, there's not a lot of snow out here on the refuge. If you watch these guys graze, we'll go ahead and move up here. Jack, Joe, step. If you watch these guys graze, this bull right here, you'll see he'll take his foot and he'll kick snow away to get to the feet. There's still a lot of feet left for these guys. You look out here, you see a lot of long grass in the middle for these guys. With all that feet, um, we will not start the feeding program. We we'll have a biologist that will come out and check. They're studying the status of the herd. They're also they're studying the status of the herd. They're also studying the uh, the amount of feed available for the elk out here, and uh, then they will make the determining factor and when they start the feeding program. Does it pretty much happen every year, though? Um, it does um, happen about every year. Um, in the 100 uh, years that the refuge has been going, there's been about eight or nine years that they haven't had to feed. The management does have a, uh, or not the management, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does have a management plan in position right now that is to reduce the dependency of the feeding program. Um, that is um, a two-pronged approach. The first approach is irrigation. A lot of the lands that we see out here are irrigated during the warmer months. Uh, in fact, they've been able to significantly increase <coughs> the amount of forage available for the elk out here on the refuge. The second approach is population management. The most effective population management tool is hunting. Um, that is just because of the fact you have people willing to give you money to go out and do the job that you would be otherwise paying money to go do. They also haul them off for free. <laughs> That's true. They're taking them home, they're putting them to good use instead of just dropping them and leaving them there. So with, the, um, with those management plans, um, they're wanting about uh, 5,000 head of elk to be wintering on the refuge every year and 500 bison to be wintering on the refuge every year. They're expecting about 750 bison this winter and about 7,000 head of elk on this uh, refuge this winter. So in the process of increasing the amount of feed available um, through the irrigation and lowering the numbers, you're increasing your chances of not having to feed during the winter. If they um, don't have to feed, that's great, but if they need to feed, they have the resources to do it. Part of the reason why they do feed these guys um, is just because of the fact that the size of the refuge is not able to sustain the amount of animals that come down here to the refuge. That's just because of human encroachment. So they do um, have the feeding for these guys. Plus, when they do run out of food, they're not just going to sit on their butts, twiddle their thumbs, and starve to death. They're going to start moving around and looking for feed. A lot of these, some of these animals out here do have what's known as brucellosis. Brucellosis is a bacterial disease. It originated in domestic cattle that came. Um, with the settlers and it has jumped over it jumped over into the elk and the bison herds and it can be transmitted back to the domestic livestock. It's a bacteria that gets around the amniotic fluid in the cow. It'll actually cause the cow to abort her calf. When that fetus is aborted out onto the ground, it is so hot with bacteria that if another animal were to come and sniff it, um, they can contract brucellosis. Even we as humans can contract the brucellosis through handling of the fetus and through the amniotic fluid we can contract it as well. With the um, elk and bison, it affects them for that first year when they do first get it. Uh, it will cause them to abort their fetus or their calf. After that, they still have the brucellosis, but it doesn't affect their calf crop. But with the uh, domestic cattle, it will affect them for the rest of their life. They will abort their calves for the rest of their foreseeable life. Jack, Joe, step. Jack, Joe. Will bison do that too? It is only once with the bison, like with the elk. 
Um, so that is part of the reason why they have the supplemental feeding program. These guys, when they run out of feed, you run the risk of these animals going and mixing in with some rancher's livestock. If one of the cows is to abort her calf in that livestock, you're going to have all of those uh, livestock sniffing, contracting the brucellosis. If they contract the brucellosis, um, then the rancher has to pay. When they shoot the calf, it's going to get underneath the skin of the calf. It'll actually um, vaccinate the calf and dissolve in the bloodstream vaccinated the calf. When they do that, they're also simultaneously going to shoot them with a paintball. That way they're marking the calf so they're not vaccinating the same calf over and over. In the uh, efforts of vaccinating out here on the National Elk Refuge, they have reduced the prevalence rate down to 30%. <laughs> With that 30% prevalence rate, it just means that only 30% of these animals either currently are affected or have been affected by the brucellosis. The prevalence of brucellosis is higher in the bison. That is because of the fact that with the bison, they're... Um, so you can use them as an example. With the scabies, it's a parasite. It gets down into the hair follicle of the animal. It starts to cause a lot of irritation. It can actually cause the animal to sit there and scratch so much to the point that their, that their uh, hair will actually start to fall out. Oh. As they're, hair, as they're scratching their hair to the point of it falling out, if they cannot grow their hair back fast enough to rebuild that insulative layer, they can actually die a death of hypothermia. But scabies is not a death sentence to these guys. See what he's doing right there? He's tilting his head back. He's doing that posturing like I was talking about earlier. I see. So he's, even though we came over and stopped here, he's getting up and saying, even though you're in the area, I'm still the big bull, so to say. <laughs> a lot of times you can see that as they're walking towards each other, they'll posture up. It's an easier way of saying, I'm the big bull, you need to get out of my way, instead of locking antlers with the other bull and pushing them. The bulls are coming, what's out of, are coming out of what's known as the rut from that to keep, um, keep your core warm. Well, these guys don't have that problem. They're only sending the minimal amount down to their legs as, 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 that they need. They also, um, you see Flat Creek running here. This bull here chewing his cud, he could be standing in Flat Creek and it could, uh, wouldn't be affecting his legs. That's just because of the fact that the cold blood coming up out of his leg is simultaneously being heated by the warm blood going down into his legs. Their veins are very close to each other, and that is a really cool adaptation. Uh, you can see he doesn't really need that extra insulation. They will sometimes lay on their legs. Uh, it's it's uh, better than laying on the snow. You can see since it is a warm day, he's laying with his legs out from underneath him. It's kind of like when you get warm underneath the blanket and you kick your leg out from underneath the blanket to cool yourself off. It's kind of what he's doing right there. Elk are what's known as a ruminant, <laughs> which means they have a multiple chamber stomach. So this guy right here, he's chewing his cud. Um, earlier he was up grazing like these other animals were. They fill their stomach and they're gonna go lay down, get comfortable. They're gonna regurgitate that food, chew that food. And they're able to lay there. They sit still, they don't make a noise, and they um, it's a camouflage so that the predators can walk right past them. They're also born with virtually no scent at all. Um, so when the cow uh, calves out, she'll separate herself away, she'll isolate herself, she'll give birth to the calf, she'll clean everything up, the calf will then uh, nurse real quick and then go lay down and hide. The cow will then leave the calf, not to it, that way it's, um, she's able to uh, prevent the attraction of anything to it. And um, she stays in the area though if she notices that some a predator is That way it allows them to rule. They're separating themselves away and allows them a better chance to find food and get food because it's a lot easier to compete for food um, with someone that is as tired as you are. <clears throat> so as it, when I, uh, sorry, my brain's not operating. I have a gremlin hitting the delete key. I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> um, when they grow their antlers out at two years old, they grow their first set of antlers. They're called, you got to be called a spike bull. And there's a couple of them laying around in here right now. It looks like two little antenna coming up out of the top of their head. They're not really anything impressive to look at. As they, uh, when they drop those antlers and they grow them back, they will grow back with a couple more points. They continue to do that till they're about the age of four or five years old, which is when they're gonna have their average set of antlers, which is gonna be six points on each side. But with that average set of antlers, they're still not going to look as impressive as this bull that's laying down right here. They're not going to have that large set of antlers. That's just because of the fact, uh, like us, when a kid hits their growth spurt, they're going to grow tall, but they're not going to fill their body out at the same time. So these elk, they're going to grow their um, antlers with their six points. 
and as they have their six points, when they grow them out, they're going to grow out to, with more mass. The antlers are going to grow out wider, and the points are going to grow longer as well. Until they're about eight years old. Eight years old is considered a mature bull. And that mature bull, that's um, the age some of these big guys here are. The one laying down, he's probably closer to nine or ten. Um, but uh, looking at them, you can get a rough guess of their age by looking at the antlers. But about eight years old, that's when they're going to have their peak set of antlers. As they do get older, they can actually start to the antlers can actually start to shrink in size. They can the mass can start to shrink. They won't have the same mass, and the points won't be as formed as they used to be as well. It's kind of like a receding hairline, so to say. They're just getting older, and they're not able to produce this, the 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 uh, testosterone and other things like that to grow their antlers out like they used to. You do see sparring out here on the refuge every now and again, but it's not really uh, to extend, especially during the rut. During the rut, these bulls are fighting through the harem. They're really fighting each other. They're really shoving each other back and forth. Out here on the National Health Refuge, they don't have the energy to really be doing it. So a lot of times, some of the bulls out here that are uh, sparring with each other, there's what's known as a satellite bull. So they're called a satellite bull because they orbit around these herms big mature bull. They'll try and sneak in and breed some of the cows while that big bull is distracted and busy. Easy. Easy. Go down. He's got a couple of points that are called cheater points. So if you look at him, he's got a couple of points that are coming out um, in areas where they wouldn't normally be coming out. Where do you work in the summer? I work at the Bar T5 Chuck Wagon Cookout and Wild West Show. Um, it's another operation that Chris and Jeff run. Um, Jack and Joe pull for that as well. It's here in Jackson. We pull um, wagons up Cash Creek Canyon. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's Dutch oven cooking and really good entertainment. So that's what I do during the summer. So I'm driving horses all year round. There you go. The butte as well, howling back. So they take the, um, the antlers out here on the refuge, they take them into the town of Jackson. They auction them off at the antler fest or the antler auction. Um, this last year was record-breaking with the amount of uh, money they made. They gathered about 8,500 pounds of antlers. Well, with that 8,500 pounds, they made $131,000. That comes out to about roughly $15.50 a pound. Well, that money comes right back into the National Elk Refuge, and it goes into things like habitat projects. So this here is one of those. Um, habitat protection and production are some of the things that they're doing, providing a lot of the migratory um, habitat for a lot of the migratory animals. Um, just like I said, they're trying to keep a balance of nature out here. There also goes into uh, the seasonal irrigation. That's how they're paying for the irrigation of the, the land out here. It also goes into GPS collars. They'll put GPS collars on the cows. That way they can track the migration of the cows, um, check where they're going when they leave the National Elk Refuge and what percentage of them come to the National Elk Refuge. They're actually, um, when they pay for the feed, it is coming from two different areas. It comes from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service budget. It also comes from the Wyoming Game and Fish. The reason why it's two different areas is because the elk, since we are in the state of Wyoming, the elk are technically owned by the Wyoming Game and Fish. But since we are on the National Elk Refuge, they're the ones that manage it. So 50% of the funding for the feeding comes from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, 
and 50% comes to the Wyoming Game and Fish. Jack, Joe, step. Okay, kids, we're going to go this clay out. You can't find them in large feed, guys, but it's very difficult. Plus, they're a very excitable horse. Uh, they take a lot more maintenance, let's say, and they're a small body with long legs so they can get tall, but they're not as thick as these guys are. You guys don't want to 